gentlemen, this is Logan from the Logan for Liberty podcast. I'm coming at you from the Pacific Northwest, where the sun shines so bright, only to rain just a couple hours later. How are you all doing? I hope you are all doing fantastic. Whether or not I'm doing fantastic, I'm always doing fantastic, even when I get passionate and rant on. Today, I have a lot of stuff I want to talk about. Um, hopefully, hopefully, I can burn through these stories rather quickly. There's a lot of stuff. Um, <clears throat> I might save NATO for last. We're going to talk about Donald Trump's tariffs and uh, how that's a disaster. Even if you're a Trump supporter, are you tired of winning yet? And we're also going to talk about... Well, we're going to talk about why tariffs and socialism is a bad idea. And if we have time, I will talk about NATO and a new Ron Paul type of character that libertarians should be looking towards or looking forward to seeing in action. Um, hmm. So, do I want to start off with the irony first? Let's start off. Let's start off with the irony first. Uh, let's make the Donald Trump fanboys hate me already. Um, listen, you can like Donald Trump. That's fine. Just uh, don't sell out your principles in order to support a demagogue. Uh, this is something that I try to think about. There is a lot of people that I like, that I look up to, and uh, it's important to stay objective. It's important to look at the issues and say, all right, this person doesn't line up with me on this and that. So I'll call them out on that, but I'll support them where they're, where they're right. And um, it, there's this podcaster who's also an entrepreneur and business owner named Jason Stapleton. He's a libertarian type of spokesperson from the Jason Stapleton program. A lot of you probably know who he is, but he has this analogy of He's on a bus, and the bus is going one direction. And that bus is going towards liberty. And to him, that bus is going towards principles that he cares about. Not just any principles. It, it, it's going towards uh, individualism, peace, tolerance, free markets. Uh, I believe that's it. Uh, yeah, individualism, peace, tolerance, free markets, and... Uh, There's one other, uh, individualism, limited government. Jason Stapleton advocates for limited government, individualism, peace, tolerance, and free markets. And his analogy is that he's on a bus and he's going one direction. And if you support him on certain issues, then go ahead and hop on, hop on the bus because it's going one direction and then get off where you need to. You know, uh, where you stand on issues that are pro-liberty, where, where you stand for liberty, He'll stand there with you. And then once you accomplish that, then you can go your separate ways. And that's sort of that's sort of my view on things. Um, so that's how I look at Donald Trump. I have a set of principles. My principles also include individualism, free markets, peace, tolerance, limited government. And then I add on to my principles and I say natural law, the scientific method, and decentralization. Um, where Donald Trump supports those issues, I support those issues too. When it comes to taxes... Um, as far as income taxes and corporate taxes, uh, I like that he likes to lower them. Uh, I liked his rhetoric on regulation for every one regulation that's passed. Uh, we should repeal two regulations. I don't like his tariffs, and we'll get on to that because it's a little counterproductive. So let's start off with a story that has a bit of irony to it. <clears throat> so basically, <laughs> um, a California-based company that sells Make America Great Again hats will have to raise their prices because tariffs will start affecting them. And if you don't know what a tariff is, it's basically just a tax. It's almost, it's basically a sales tax. That's really what it is, but it's not a sales tax on a broad as in consumption tax or luxury tax. It's a tax on imported goods from other countries. So, Donald Trump has uh, imposed tariffs that will target $200 billion worth of Chinese imports. And ma basically meaning that it'll... It, it's, it's sort of a way that protectionists implement policies to win the Rust Belt to protect steel jobs. Essentially, because we all know that products that are imported from other countries are made, made from other countries. So, for instance, products that are made in Taiwan or China... 
it'll say made in Taiwan, made in China, and they're generally cheaper than the products that are made in America. And there are a lot of, yeah, I only buy products from America. Go ahead, do what you want. If, that, if that's you, fine. But the tariffs basically will add a tax to these objects that we have to pay if we want to buy these products. Um... If you're a protectionist, do you think this is good? If you're a free market capitalist and you understand that this... Or if you're a free market capitalist, do you think this is sort of a bad idea? Unfortunately, there are protectionists who call themselves capitalists. And sort of like how there's uh, national socialists, um, there's national capitalists, unfortunately. They think free trade should stay within the borders. <clears throat> The latest round of tariffs on products from China proposed by Donald Trump could double the price of Make America Great Again hats inspired by his 2016 campaign slogan, according to a merchandiser who imports them. The new tariffs, announced Thursday, would hit $200 billion worth of Chinese imports, especially consumer goods, including the popular hats supported or sported by Trump supporters around the nation. According to a story first reported by the Associated Press, David Lassoff is the manager of a California-based company that sells a range of novelty items online. He told ABC News his company, Incredible Gifts, typically imports the red hats from China and embroiders them in the U.S., but now the company may have to complete both tasks in the U.S., which could raise prices significantly. We usually sell the MAGA hats around for $9 to $12, but it could go up to $20 if we had to make them in the U.S. and embroider them here. So, let me just uh, uh, interject right there, right now. Some of you will be like, oh, well, so what? It's just a couple extra bucks, and in this case, anywhere from 11 to 8 bucks, 8 to 11 bucks. I know that's not a lot. But, but understand that this is a luxury item. Um, uh, we've seen prices uh, go up, possibly go up also on construction materials. So, for instance, steel. Imported steel, which allows us to build houses cheaply. Or cheaper, comparative to um, how we would if we bought products strictly from here. Now... Uh, an 8 to 11 bucks difference isn't that big of a deal, especially on uh, luxury items such as a hat. Um, but if you think about it, that's almost that's almost double the price of what it was. So imagine what it would be like on steel. This is just hats. Imagine what it would be like on steel. Steel is already expensive. We already have a housing crisis. There's more demand than there is supply. Um... So just think about that for a second if you're going to go, oh, well, that's not bad. It's just a hat and that's only a 50% or an hun that's a 100% increase, actually, um, over 8 to 11 bucks. Yeah, a 90 to 100% increase. It's I know it's just hats, but think about it when we import steel to build houses. We already have a housing crisis because of zoning laws, um, regulation, and so on, and because of demand. It's not, the supply isn't meeting the demand. So just think about that in broader terms. Don't let the hat uh, get you and say, oh, see, tariffs aren't that bad. It's only on luxury items. I'm just reading you this story because it's a little, there, there's a bit of irony underneath it. Lassoff said, a few Chinese manufacturers recently notified his company that they were nervous about the potential impact of these tariffs and, in the future, may change more money per order. There might be a limited quantity of hats in the future. We're trying to make sure we have enough hats in stock now. So if things change, we're prepared, he said. The U.S. Trade Representative's office did not respond to ABC News' request for comment. While Incredible Gifts isn't affiliated with the Trump campaign, Lassoff said in the company, the company has sold a few hundred thousand MAGA hats since Trump announced his candid candidacy in June of 2015. They're our hottest item, he said, of the classic red hats with embroidered white lettering. Amy Lee, manager of the Hat Depot, a New Jersey-based company that also sells the unofficial MAGA hats, said the hats are a big product for her company as well. 
their best seller, she said, adding that her company sells these hats in different colors and typically receives 20 orders a day of the red hats alone. But Lee said manufacturers in China haven't yet reached out to the Hat Depot about the possible impact of these tariffs. We buy our hats from China for 3 bucks and we sell them for 14 she told NBC News, adding that the Chinese factory does everything from manufacturing to embroidery. Moving forward, Lassoff said his company is thinking about importing goods from Vietnam to avoid the proposed tariffs. I think they would be negative for any business selling goods from China, he said. He attributes the difficulty of manufacturing goods in the U.S. to taxes and regulations and safety issues that he says makes it hard to run a business. Lassoff said he also hopes big online retailers like Amazon and Walmart would lobby against the proposed tariffs on behalf of smaller companies that use their platforms. Our company is way too small to do anything, he said. So first of all, I want to kind of go on a tangent here, go off the beaten path, and uh, specifically address the part where he says that he hopes retailers like Amazon and Walmart will lobby against the proposed tariffs on behalf of smaller companies that use their platforms. They probably won't. Because Amazon and Walmart, they're going to love these tariffs. Now, it, it might hurt their bottom line, but it will drown out competition to smaller retailers. So, unless, uh, oh, I can't remember his name. But the CEO of Amazon, unless he has a uh, philosophical principled backbone he probably will welcome these tariffs more so than uh the smaller businesses and walmart will probably like that too because well it'll kill smaller businesses as well it evens out the competition now amazon has an advantage compared to walmart in this instance too because well walmart um has only now started picking up the slack with online retail amazon just surpassed them walmart was being lazy they weren't predicting a change in the market like most smart business owners have to do, so they fell behind on that. And that brings up this whole thing about tariffs. Tariffs are not good. Now, if you're a Donald Trump supporter or you're listening to Trump's rhetoric, the tariffs are, are in response to unfair trade deals. Well, we need to talk about something. Trade deals or trade, free trade, will never be fair. There's no such thing as fair trade. Each country has different needs. They have different things that they need from different countries so we might be buying a lot of more chinese products and the chinese might be buying less products from us therefore there's a bit of a discrepancy there's a bit of a deficit um not not money wise but uh you know they're we're buying more stuff from them therefore in donald trump's view we're supporting china but china isn't supporting us and that's not how it goes the truth is if that's what he's talking about when he says unfair trade deals, China doesn't need anything that we produce. It just doesn't. As far as, uh, in the sense that Donald Trump is imagining, we need more from China. Because we're not really a manufacturing nation anymore. And I know a lot of Rust Belt people and um, older conservative type types of people see the export of manufacturing jobs as a negative. But it's not a negative. The economy changes. We have less agriculture than we do than we did 100 years ago. And we have less industrial plants than we did 50 years ago. And that's just what happens. We have a more services and... Not good, but services and information-based economy. And we have to change for that. We can't use the force of government to force the economy to stay the same just because we're not willing to change. Now, I know it is scary when the economy changes because then you have to take responsibility for yourself. But as conservatives, as free marketeers, aren't we supposed to champion the idea of taking responsibility for yourself? The government isn't supposed to take care of you for when you make a mistake or are unwilling to change. We're not talking about culture here changing. We're talking about the economy changing. And when the economy changes, it's generally for the better. You want the economy to move forward. We want to produce things cheaper. <clears throat> and a lot of these uh, protectionist policies that have been coming out from the conservative Donald Trump base as of late, these aren't conservative policies, which is what really amazes me. Th these aren't capitalist policies. 
These are national socialist policies. This is Bernie Sanders type of stuff. This is Nazi Germany type of stuff. This is Keynesian type of stuff. This is um, uh, consumer side economics. And that's not, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, the economy does better and poverty diminishes when we produce more. Because the more we produce, the cheaper goods become. It's basic supply and demand. When there's more supply than there is demand, the supply becomes cheaper. When there's more demand than there is supply, the supply becomes more expensive. Which is why when we impose tariffs, we, produ we bring in less production, we produce less, we have less material available to the consumer base, therefore it is a lot more expensive for the consumer. Not only that, but because it costs us more to produce it here at home because of safety standards, regulations, our minimum wage, and the fact that we expect a higher wage for this production, therefore that also raises consumer prices. So uh, markets are a bit complex, but there's simple rules at play. And tariffs are just as bad as the idea of socialism. And in fact, I think they come from the same place because it's typically the same side that want to protect the workers, therefore they implement protectionist policies. Um, tariffs are a bad idea. And l let's say that it is a, a negative that China isn't buying as much as we are buying from them. If China is cutting off their leg, why would you cut off your leg too? Listen, if, if China wants to have protectionist policies, they're only hurting their people. So we don't need to hurt ours in order to get back at China, which is why I'm opposed to these tariffs. It's a bad idea. And since we're talking about tariffs, I want to talk about Cuba, um, a socialist nation, well, communist nation. <clears throat> there's people, I, I know there's people out there that try to say, oh, you don't know the difference between socialism and communism. You conflate them. Uh, to an extent. Thing about socialism, and socialism, personally, I'm against any Keynesian economics or uh, um, egalitarian type of economic systems, which is why I'm a capitalist. I believe in individualism as opposed to collectivism. So I'm not against workers uniting to get something done because that's freedom of speech and that's something I support but I don't like the idea of the fruits of my labor being taken away to help a political agenda or to go to another worker who isn't as productive as I am and there is before I go on there's something that I think we need to talk about there's something I think we need to acknowledge is that working harder doesn't necessarily mean that you are more productive or that you generate more value uh, in the literal sense of working hard, but in the figurative sense, as in if you try really hard to increase your human capital, then uh, in that sense, working harder is more beneficial. So let's talk about, oh, uh, um, one thing though is if I had to choose a system, you, you put a gun in my head and you made me choose between socialism and communism, I'd take the bullet. No, I'm just kidding. Um, now, I probably would take the bullet. No, but socialism is better and co better than communism in the se in idea on paper. In the idea, because communism generally requires a state. Which is why I find anarcho-communism really interesting. Because it's just socialism. Socialism is a more decentralized egalitarian economic system. A.K.A. anarcho-communism. Or libertarian socialism. That being said, we do have things like National Socialism. We do have, it's it's a really confusing, convoluted process. And sometimes how socialism or communism is explained changes from the person, person to person. Whether or not it's an anti-capitalist or, or an anti-socialist or a pro-socialist person talking about it. It tends to change. But anyway, let's move on to Cuba. Uh, the Cuban government will recognize private property under the new drafted constitution in an attempt to boost prosperity. Even though the government will recognize private property, this isn't a full embracement of free enterprise, the Communist Party will still remain in control of Cuba. As of right now, under the current constitution, Cuba recognizes state cooperative farms and personal and venture property. Basically, everything is still owned by the state and by the workers. However, the Cuban government will tighten its regulator. E even though they're recognizing private property, 
the Cuban government will tighten its uh, regulatory control over property and economy. So there's sort of a trade-off, but they're inching in the right direction, and private property is being recognized. So let me read through the article. Um, Communist-run Cuba will officially recognize private property, something it has long rejected as a vestige of capitalism, under a new constitution that also creates the position of prime minister along the president's state media reported on Saturday. Uh, Cuba's current Soviet-era constitution only recognizes state, cooperative, farmer, personal, and joint venture property, but former President Raul Castro's market reforms aimed at trying to boost the economy and make Cuban socialism more sustainable have prompted hundreds of thousands of Cubans to join the ranks of the islands self-employed since 2010, and new privately owned businesses ranging from restaurants to beauty salons. Basically, what is happening is, over time, even with the attempt to push towards a more socialistic economy, the, ten, the natural inclination of human nature was to revert back towards capitalism. Uh, w whether or not you can call this poor capitalism, because um, the definition of cap capitalism is the private ownership of the, over the means of production. So when the state gets involved, it, it, it's not really capitalism, which is why most capitalists, when they talk about capitalism, they're talking about free market capitalism. This is why the not real socialism and not real capitalism is are, are completely different arguments, and that's something I want to touch on later on. With that being said, though, all this proves is that the best way for a socialist or communist dictators or governments... The best thing, the only way for them to actually sustain themselves and survive and continue to prosper is to adopt free market ideas. And here's the thing is even though they're adopting private property, they're trying to do some sort of mixed economy, which is what most economies do. Almost every single economy in order to prosper has to at least inch towards the direction of free market capitalism and private property because it incentivizes you to produce more um so typically that that's why most countries tend to be market economies because on paper socialism and communism sound really good but in practice no not so much so we start to implement free market capitalism uh private property principles so let's continue Ruling Communist Party newspaper Grana published a summary of the new constitution on Saturday, saying a draft it had seen included 224 articles, up from 137 previously. Details were not immediately available, and Reuters did not see the draft, but Grana said an enshrined recognition of both f the free market and private property in Cuba's new Magna Carta. That could mean enhanced legal protections for Cuba's fledging entrepreneurs and foreign investors too. Even though Grana said the constitution reaffirmed that central planning and state enterprise are the pillars of the economy overall. So basically, these people who are in charge, the ruling parties that are in charge, are they want to re they want to retain power, obviously. They want to preserve power for themselves. That's what politicians do is they seek power that's what humans do that's not just what politicians do any individual wants to be in a higher status whether it's wealth power and the ability to use coercion whatever it may be once you acquire power which you always want to acquire power but once you do acquire power you want to keep it although they are seemingly uh, starting to recognize that their system isn't working as well as they want it to work. And we'll actually talk about that later um, in a little bit. We'll talk about Cuban doctors revolting against their government. And that's a whole long convoluted conversation. So this podcast might run a little long. It also noted the Communist Party would remain as Cuba's dominant political force. As I was talking about earlier, politicians or people in general want to keep the power that they acquired, whether or not it was just. Cuba expert Luis Carlos Batista at the Washington-based Center for Democracy in the Americas cautioned that the acknowledgement 
of private property did not mean the government wanted to give private enterprise a greater role. Again, this plays back into what I said. Earlier this week, he noted the government published a set of regulations tightening control on the self-employed and hiking possible fines to include private or to include include property confiscation. Basically, uh, as we know it as Americans, eminent domain. Um, where was I? <clears throat> According to Grana, the government commission revamping the Constitution will present its draft to the National Assembly when it meets next week. It will then be put to a national referendum expected later this year. The commission is headed by Castro, 87, who remains the head of the Communist Party. New President Miguel Diaz-Canel, who sits on the commission, is also expected to announce his Council of Ministers at the Assembly meeting. Apart from introducing the position of Prime Minister, dividing the roles of Head of State and the Head of Government, the new Constitution makes the President Head of the Assembly and imposes a term limit on the Presidency of two consecutive five-year periods. Castro, who together with his older, late brother Fidel Castro, ruled the country for nearly 60 years, had proposed the limit in 2011 as part of a bid to modernize the political system. Now. I don't think they're attempting to modernize the political system, but what I do think is that they are recognizing public support for a more decentralized government, more of a separation of powers, even though the government will gain a little bit more control over the people, as we read in the article, that they are going to tighten regulation on private property, basically allowing them to seize private property as they wish. In other words, it's sort of, what they're doing is, is with the personal property that's already available or the private businesses that are already existing what they're doing as a fail safe in case they want to re-implement the communist party back to its glory its socialistic glory is they're leaving them a way or a method to seize private property if they decide that they no longer want private property it's basically the government in the United States just using eminent domain to seize all of the property. And uh, all they have to do is change the definition of um, what just compensation is. So they could define just compensation as uh, 10 bucks for your entire acre of property. Because, you know, you're getting some money instead of no money. That's a tangent that I just went on. Uh, so we're going to talk about Cuban doctors, and I read this article, I found it interesting, and it sort of acts as a cautionary tale against universal health care. So this podcast might be my longest podcast yet, but regardless, it's something I want to talk about. Before I continue on though, each podcast that I have is going to be around 30 to 45 minutes on average. If it takes me a full 65 minutes to get something done, to go through all the stories I want to go to or to make my point, then that is what I am going to do. I'm not going to stress to get it within a certain time frame because it's my podcast. I can do what I want, but I am definitely going to give you a pretty lengthy podcast so you're not just clicking on two minute videos. I will probably have shorter videos uploaded, but for the podcast, 30 to 65 minutes, anywhere between there. Probably on average 40 minutes, 40 to 45 minutes. With that being said, there is a podcast that will come out every Tuesday. Guaranteed scheduled every Tuesday. I don't have a specific time because it depends on when I get up and when I feel like working. But other than that, every Tuesday there will be a podcast. And not only will there be a podcast every Tuesday, but if I get time, there will be more podcasts throughout the week so Wednesday we released a podcast and this if everything goes right this comes out on Thursday um, and then next Tuesday you'll have a podcast but if everything goes right I'll have a podcast on on either Monday or Wednesday but definitely there will be a podcast on Tuesday all right so let's continue so basically Cuba they have full control over their healthcare system. Um, therefore, doctors are heavily regulated and they are considered employees of the state. 
And Cuba has a program in order to show the world that they can be medical leaders in the world, even, you know, they have control of their health care. It's basically, it, it, Michael Moore and other left-wingers have praised Cuba for having successful health care, having a successful universal health care program. It's their sort of go-to area or go-to country, sort of like the uh, social democracies of Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. Um, however, there's, there's a caveat, to, or there's there's a downside to it. Um, so basically, since they have control over healthcare, you as a doctor are a state employee, and they allow other countries to pur purchase their doctors, and uh, allow them to do medical missions overseas. However, the government takes a significant portion of the doctor's salaries. Uh, many doctors, after leaving Cuba and discovering, are, are discovering there are places where they can practice medicine freely, are attempting to seek asylum in other countries where they can actually be compensated for their work. Cuban doctors also used to seek asylum in the United States of America because we have a, well, not necessarily, but we have a freer market for the most part, compared to a lot of uh, other countries. It's not a free market healthcare system. We haven't had one for decades. But basically, they come here because even though we don't have a free market healthcare system, they're not employees of the state. Um, so they used to seek asylum in the United States where they can actually be compensated for their work. Um, however, in, in attempts to further... Uh, peace and trade between the United States and Cuba. Obama, Obama, when he met with the Cubans, ended a program which was allowing Cuban doctors to seek asylum and work here as doctors. And of course, we were like, yeah, you know, why wouldn't we let doctors come here? Because why not have an abundance of skilled doctors? That makes sense. And personally, I support trade with Cuba. That's something I 100% support. But I don't think, ah, it, it's such a convoluted thing as a libertarian because I support free trade, but at the same time, we're not allowed to give doctors asylum that are fleeing Cuba. It, it, it's pretty sad. Um, in a rare act of collective defiance, scores of Cuban doctors working overseas to make money for their families and their country are suing to break ranks with the Cuban government, demanding to be released from what one judge called a form of slave labor. So I don't know if you guys are aware of this or if any of you remember it, but Rand Paul, Ron Paul's son, Rand Paul, senator from Kentucky, and Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont, both extremely opposite. Rand Paul supports a free market healthcare system, while Bernie Sanders supports a single payer universal healthcare system. They got in an argument where, or in a debate, and Ron Paul, not Ron Paul, sorry, Rand Paul said basically that universal health care would essentially make doctors slaves because it's implying if you have a right to health care that you have a right to another doctor's labor. And I know if you support universal health care or you think health care is a human right, then you hear that and that's just absurd to you. And Bernie Sanders even said that that was absurd and then he asked a doctor who was sitting at the... I don't remember the exact situation or what it was about, but he asked the doctor who they were talking to if she felt like a slave. And she said no. But lo and behold, a couple years later, we have doctors wanting to revolt from Cuba and actually work on their own because they feel like they are slaves. And this is sort of a cautionary tale of universal health care. And let me tell you why it's a cautionary tale of universal health care. So, you, let's say, okay, so let's say you have a seed. Okay, and we're going to we're gonna make an analogy here. And I know analogies aren't perfect, but let's just, let's just go with it for the sake of argument. So, you think that health care is a human right. Okay, fine. So you plant the seed, which allows the government to tax people and give them and give everybody health care. And it sounds fine on paper. Everybody has health care. But what you create is a moral hazard. And if you don't know what a moral hazard is, in the 16th century, English insurance companies were finding that people who had purchased insurance for their property were more likely 
to need to use the insurance than or were more likely to have property damage than people who didn't have insurance because when these people didn't have insurance they didn't they had more incentive to take care of their property but property owners who had insurance well there was no incentive to take care of their property they knew they would be compensated therefore they would either mistreat their place or they would make poor decisions that would lead to damage and insurance companies in England in the 16th century saw this and realized that therefore we have things like if you have property damage your rates grow up because it's concluded that yeah you're at risk and that's why um with car insurance if you're caught speeding you'll have higher rates if you get pulled over and get a speeding ticket because you're a danger you're more at risk to with to 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 um uh, using pooled resources so that's what a moral hazard is it's when you place a policy that affects human behavior so with universal health care if you know that you are going to be supplied health you start not caring about much you start not caring about your health or your personal decisions therefore you make bad decisions or you let yourself grow so that seed sprouts a branch well guess what since people are there's a moral hazard and people are making bad decisions it drains resources a lot quicker than what it would have if there was an incentive not to uh, draw money from the insurance company basically you make poor decisions and maybe you smoke maybe you you're overweight you eat too many carbohydrates therefore you're more likely to develop health risks and that brings in this whole conversation with pre-existing conditions which we can talk about okay so what do we do about that people are using resources we've already sprouted off a branch the government sees a problem hey we're using a lot more money because we're on universal health care we're taking care of people that are making poor decisions and this policy guarantees it's a subsidy it's not insurance it guarantees you compensation if you get sick so people make bad decisions as I said I probably said that five times already and I'm going in circles okay so how do we solve that well you can either increase taxes which gives the government more power so you've sprouted another root or another branch from the seed another root in this case you have sprouted another root from the seed awesome so not only have we created a moral hazard we've created maybe higher tax rates and then what we start doing is we start taxing healthy people that are still productive who are healthy in order to subsidize subsidize those who make bad decisions so now we have three things three roots that have sprouted from the seed now what else can we do to save money well we've already raised taxes we've raised taxes on everybody and we've also raised taxes on those who are healthier and wealthier because they're able to be more productive what else can the government do in order to save money well they start rationing health care meaning they choose who and who not to give health care to we have four things that have sprouted from the seed that was basically the government taking over the health care industry and administering health care but they have to solve this problem of the moral hazard and because if, if like I said if it's provided for you you don't really have an incentive to stay healthy so because of that the government gets to say all right well not only are we gonna raise taxes on everybody and on the healthy and on the wealthy people who are productive we're also gonna start rationing health care because we can't afford to cover everybody especially those who are more at risk also what we can do is we can start passing laws to regulate your behavior boom so what else how does that work well we're gonna make it illegal to do drugs therefore we're gonna spend more money on the drug war lock people up for doing drugs we're going to ban smoking cigarettes we're going to give everybody based on their height age and gender we're gonna determine a healthy weight uh, range that they can be in and we'll give you maybe a 20 to to five pound grace period and then we're also going to say hey you can't drink because that creates um, a risk for you to make a poor decision that creates a risk for you to use resources for health reasons 
Also, we're going to ban certain foods, a.k.a. the tax on sugary beverages, so on and so forth. So do you see what I'm saying? It creates, once the government gets involved in supplying health care for everybody using tax money, it then has to find a way to ration that money and their justification for passing laws is for the interests of saving money. Meaning they've created an excuse just by supplying you healthcare to write laws to save money and make sure that they can ration healthcare. So if that's what happens, that's that's what we see with Cuba. They supplied healthcare for everybody. So basically the doctors are owned by the state because the entire industry is owned by the state. Thousands of Cuban doctors work abroad under contracts with the Cuban authorities. Countries like Brazil pay the island's communist government millions of dollars every month to provide the medical services, effectively making the doctors Cuba's most valuable export. And that's what happens when it's not an individual free market system. The government owns the healthcare industry. And the government has to make money somehow because they're providing you with healthcare. Therefore, they're wasting money because it creates a moral hazard. But the doctors get a small cut of that money. Again, not surprising because universal health care creates a moral hazard. And a growing number of them in Brazil have begun to rebel. In the last year, at least 150 Cuban doctors have filed lawsuits in Brazilian courts to challenge the arrangement demanding to be treated as independent contractors who earn full salaries, not the agents of the Cuban state. You see, all of this could have been avoided if Cuban doctors were independent to begin with. And I know for those of you who are for universal health care, this seems insane. But if you listened to anything I said five minutes earlier, even though I was going in circles, you start to question, yeah, maybe you start to question the prospects of having a government that's in your healthcare. Because then it starts to control every aspect of your life in order to save money, to prevent rationing, so on and so forth. When you leave Cuba for the first time, you discover many things that you had been blind to, said Yeli Jimenez Gutierrez, one of the doctors who filed suit. There comes a time when you get tired of being a slave. And remember, Bernie Sanders ridiculed Rand Paul for saying that if you establish a universal health care system, that the doctors essentially become slaves. Well, if you're guaranteeing, guaranteeing health care for all, you kind of enslave your doctors. You assume ownership of your doctor. Austin Peterson talks about this and if you don't know who Austin Peterson is I'll just give you a few descriptors or a sort of bullet point listing of his resume um he was a producer for Freedom Watch which was hosted by Judge Napolitano on Fox News or Fox Business I think it was Fox Business Austin Peterson was a 2016 presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party Austin Peterson is currently the 2000 18 or yeah 2018 uh senatorial candidate for the United States Senate in Missouri as a Republican Austin Peterson has made this uh this this wonderful scenario what happens if you're on an island and some guy needs open heart surgery but you only have one doctor on the island who can do open heart surgery but he's on vacation or he's on his day off what if he's too tired? Does the government have the right to come in, kidnap him from his home, and force him to do open heart surgery? And of course you might say, well the moral thing is for him to do open heart surgery. But also, the moral thing is to not force the doctor to do open heart surgery. But that's just an analogy. What happens if the doctor refuses to do open heart surgery? Right then, right there. What do you do? You throw him in prison. Because he didn't obey you because you own him. And that's the danger of universal health care. If you are under a universal health care system, you run the risk of being a slave in your career field. Now I could now there's a difference in my opinion between what what I think is interesting is doctors who are not government employees should be able to be treated as independent contractors. However, um, military doctors, military medics, 
I think that they should be allowed to make money for the government because if you sign up to be a medic in the military in the U.S. Armed Forces, then yeah, you know, you can do missions overseas and some of that money goes to you, some of it goes to the government. That's un that's understandable. But in Cuba, if you're a doctor, you are a government employee. Cuban artists and athletes have defected during overseas trips for decades, most of them winding up in the United States, but the lawsuits in Brazil represent an unusual rebellion that takes aim at one of Cuba's signature efforts. Spending, sending doctors overseas is not only a way for Cuba to earn much needed, in, much needed income, but it also helps promote the nation's image as a medical powerhouse that routinely comes to the world's, world's aid. The legal challenges are all the more important because the doctors have lost the common backup plan, going to the United States. The American government, which has long tried to undermine Cuba's leaders, established a program in 2006 to welcome Cuban doctors with the aim of exacerbating the island's brain drain. Okay, that's interesting to me. I have no doubt that maybe one of the intentions behind the program was to drain Cuba of their brain drain, there's, of, of their talent pool. I have no doubt about that. But that's not the entire reason why we would implement such a policy. Another reason why we would implement such a policy is because, yeah, we're going to take immigrants who are more skilled. That's why most legal immigrants that we accept are doctors, are engineers, are scientists, are construction workers, they are people of immense talent and have they have high IQs. They are a net benefit to our society. Therefore, the government go our government goes out of the way to seek these types of people. All right, let's continue. But in one of his final attempts to normalize relations with Cuba, President Barack Obama in January ended the program, which had allowed Cuban doctors stationed in other countries to get permanent residency visas for the United States. The end of the program was a huge blow to us, said Marilis Alvarez Rodriguez, another of the doctors who sued in Brazil. That was our way out. The end of the visa program means that the future of these doctors now rests in the hands of the Brazilian courts. They have mostly ruled against the doctors, but some judges have sided with them, allowing the doctors to work on their own and get paid directly, which they should be allowed to. They're not owned by the state well in cuba they're owned by the state but they shouldn't be owned by the state so what we're seeing in cuba is uh some doctors are politically active some doctor or some some judges are politically active some judges want to mend a relationship between cuba and brazil and don't want to do anything to ruin a brazilian cuban relationship other doctors either want to see the demise of the cuban cuban communist regime or they just want talented doctors to come over and be allowed to stay and make money. So that those are two things that are going on. Well, technically three, but two main sides. And the one side has two reasons. The doctor's defiance puts them at risk of serious repercussions by the Cuban government, including being barred from the island and their families for years. Now, I don't think the Cuban government personally is going to bar talented doctors from entering their country, especially if they're trying to uh, put up an image of them being a medical powerhouse. I do see them, though, separating their families, keeping them imprisoned, or keeping their families imprisoned. That's that's my guess. I could be wrong, but that, that that's a logical thing. If I were a totalitarian, that's what I'd do. If, if I was a totalitarian, uh, authoritarian type of person, if I was a dictator and I wanted to keep my power, and if I actually believed in all these policies, which I don't. The seeds of the rebellion were planted a year ago in a conversation between a Cuban doctor and a clergyman in a remote village in northeastern Brazil. Anise Deli Grana de Cal... Carvalho, a doctor from Cuba, was coming to the end of her three-year medical assignment. But having married a Brazilian man, she wanted to stay and keep working. The pastor was outraged to learn that, under the terms of their employment, Cuban doctors earn only about a quarter of the amount the Brazilian government pays Cuba for their services. So think of 
Think of that. That is a 75% tax rate on your income. Because essentially in Cuba, these doctors are owned by the government. There's a lot more in this article, but uh, I will link it in the description box below so you can read it. But it's basically just going over the details of these doctors, of what they are saying. But just imagine that. Imagine being owned by the state because you are a talented doctor. That is slavery. There's no other option for them other than to sue or seek asylum in another country and pray to God or, or pray to, to luck or something. Cross their fingers and hope they're lucky that they'll be able to stay. And it entirely depends on what judge they get. What political leaning these judges have. Are these judges ones who will uphold the law no matter what? Are these judges that are favorable towards a Cuban-Brazilian relationship to the point where they will sell out individuals? Uh, or are these judges ones who believe in free market individualism? Or are these judges ones that want to see the fall of the Cuban communist regime? And according to the article, most people favor the former two over the latter two. And it's unfortunate and it's sad. And that just goes, that's a cautionary tale to people or to the idea of establishing a single payer universal healthcare system. It's not practical. It costs money. It costs so much money to the point where the Cuban government basically owned and shipped these people out as a commodity, as a, as an export, as product, instead of individuals working on their own behalf. Instead of individuals working to produce and get compensated for it, the government is basically forcing these people to produce for the government. And this is why I, on any level, will refuse to accept a, a universal healthcare system. And I, I've talked about states' rights and the Constitution basically taking away power from the federal government, basically saying that, hey, this these things should be handled on a state level. That's more of a, a strategy to limit federal government power than anything. Personally, I would never, even on a state level, I would never advocate for universal health care. You see, I believe in simple principles. I believe in individualism. I believe in free market, peace, tolerance, limited government. I believe in decentralization, but mo I believe in the scientific method. I believe in natural law. And with natural law, it comes individualism, the, the right for you to own your own body, free markets, the absence of the state within the market, because when the government takes over the market, you risk doing things like this. This is a cautionary tale. I can't say that enough of what happens when you allow the government to seize certain in industries in the name of egalitarianism, in the name of uh, morality. And there is nothing moral about having doctors as, as slaves. You can go ahead and say healthcare shouldn't be for profit. But uh, the matter of the fact is these doctors need to make a profit. And the matter of the fact is even a government with a universal healthcare system has to make a profit. Otherwise tax money is being wasted. And it's, it's a sad unfortunate truth that these doctors from Cuba are slaves and only get 25% if they're lucky of their own income. And that's it. Uh, just take with that what you will. Links will be in the description box below about this story. Um, this is something I am 100% passionate about. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Every Tuesday, there will be another Logan for Liberty podcast. And even, even if I upload them on Tuesday, look out Monday. Or look out uh, Sunday, Monday, or Wednesday for any additional podcasts, which I will consider to be bonuses. Other than that, guys, um, this is amazing. Check out 
the links in the description box below to read the articles, to check me out on Twitter and or Facebook, and don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can be notified when I upload a video. Peace out, guys. I hope you all have a good one.